first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It has been a great pleasure to be here and listen to all these fantastic talks. My talk is in three segments. Number one, do we have to do that? Do we have to do a spinal fusion in a surgery center setting? Is that a problem that we have to solve? Number, the second segment is about if you are going to do that, what uh, problems are we going to encounter? And this third segment is about, um, and the third segment is about uh, how, are we, how are we going to overcome those problems? Now, I'm trying to do that here. Okay, well, you know, spine is number one reason for disability. The numbers are staggering. This is a public health issue. And uh, I think I have to use the computer. And that makes sense. That It used to be number one, number two, number three in the United States. Then it became number four globally in 2015. And now global is number one reason for disability. And the simple reason for that is that society is aging, not only in our country, but in most of the countries around the world. As a matter of fact, these are the numbers. These are statistics. By the time you are 50 years old, there's only a 32% chance you don't have spine problem. By the time you are 70 years old, there's only 1% to 2% chance you don't have spine problem. Not all of them need surgery, thanks God, but, uh, and not all of them need fusion. But percentually, that number is increasing. How much that number is increasing? Staggering. This is not a rare disease. This is a truly a public health, a huge financial economic issue. So there is a problem, and this problem needs new way to look at it. Now, for people who know, going from open to MIS is not about the skin incision, it's about what happens under the skin that makes a surgery MIS. And uh, more or less, we don't tell our patient in open surgery, we separate all those muscles, and we don't reattach any of that. Our orthopedic college here know how it works that if you do a shoulder surgery and you don't reattach the tendon, you're uh, rendering that joint physiologically ineffective. But as well, I think one of the problem with open traditional surgery is that we are interrupting the feet loop back mechanism of muscle regulation, and that has a huge impact on recovery and time to recover. The third aspect of the, the MIS versus open, or I would say muscle sparing not versus non-muscle sparing is the vascularization of the bone. That's another thing that we don't tell most of our patient, that patient does not have an artery of L4 or L5. The vascularization of most of our bone is through surrounding muscle. In traditional TLF, TLF, PLF, you're separating vast majority of the muscle of the attached to the vertebral body, which are posterior. This study is done in 1930s that by practically 75% of the vascularization of the vertebral body is through posterior element. When you do a traditional PLIF or TLIF, go all the way to the lateral gutter, practically you're reducing the vascularization of the bone to 25% of the original value. This is a patient of mine. Um, on the left, you see a two-level TLIF in 2012. In two years later, in 2014, I did a one-level uh, transcambine OLIF. In 2015, patient had a car accident. I had to take the patient back. And we all understand where we do TLF when you go six months later back, there's no muscle there. Everything is a solid score and very uh, less vascularized. But in muscle sparing technique, as expected, there's virtually no scar. And all those muscles that they don't turn into scar can help the patient to recover. This is as well a patient of mine. One level TLF, even two levels above it, as uh, you may see in the upper left, the multifidus muscle has turned into scar. All of this not only have overall impact on the outcome, but as well in about, uh, has an impact on how fast can you let the patient go, go home. Because patient has to recover from that. Another very important factor doing a surgery as an outpatient is the time under anesthesia. And if anybody has a doubt about that time under anesthesia is important, talk to your anesthesiologist. Generally, in most of surgery centers, and your anesthesiologist won't accept any cases that the total anesthesia time is more than three hours. And this is not quantified. This is based on almost uh, 388,000 uh, patient meta-analysis that shows every additional half an hour under anesthesia adds 17% to the combined risk of the surgery. 
And practically, the, the math of it comes out to surgeries under two hours are half as risky than surgeries under uh, above two hours. And that has been significantly quantified. Now, um, I'm going today, obviously, talk about two of the methods that I use to reduce, overcome these problems. One of them is oblique lateral posterior lumbar interbody fusion. That's very distinct from uh, OLIF ATP anterior to psoas. And another, uh, and I have been doing that for the last 12 years. Um, and then another procedure, MISTLF, partly prone lateral with the same instrumentation. Now, the result I'm going to give you is based on 1,550 patients and over 3,000 levels. So to have 12 years of data gathered and collected, and we have published multiple papers about this. And uh, this surgery, um, with some modification, can be done in a vast variety of levels, including 5S1. I think that's a crucial thing. And we have published um, numerous papers about different techniques to overcome certain technical difficulty of this. But uh, based on 1,550 cases, um, about 39% of our fusion, this is no discectomy, this is not a decompression, these are all fusions. 39% are under one hour, 95% are under two hours, and 99.4% of the surgery are under three hours. And I'm talking not about one and two level fusion on a BMI of 22. I'm talking about three and four level fusion on 80 old people with BMI about 50 included in that data set. Now, this is one of the papers we published. And as expected, you see that the blue line um, is a regular TLIF with higher BMI. The time under, um, uh, the time under anesthesia co correlate directly with the, the immediate perioperative outcome. And as expected, higher BMI relates to more problem. That the red line is a star TLIF, MIS TLIF surgeon, somebody who has done thousands of MIS TLIF, and even in his hand, you know, it's very efficient, but then at the BMI of 37, it almost flipped. We know about that. Higher level of complexity are less suitable for MIS. Now, the transcaminolif is the green line right down there. And in the second study, we could show that even higher complexity the BMI is not a big factor in performance of the surgery because once the tube is in place, it doesn't matter if you go through two inch or four inch of adipose tissue. And I think this is uh, one of the reasons why I, uh, we can shift this patient to the surgery center. 96% of these patients um, are ambulating within the first 24 hours, and so they can go home within the first 24 hours. As a matter of fact, these are uh, comparable uh, numbers about how these surgeries are done. Yesterday, just before I came over, we did four fusions in our surgery center, and everybody went home at 4 o'clock. So by following certain algorithmic ways, and I'm going to talk about it a little, you can literally replicate the results. And too bad Dr. Gasco is not here. He was planning to be here until he got sick. But he has, uh, in the last year and a half or two years, a lot of experience with that. And I was really looking forward to listening about his experience as a proof that this is not a surgeon specific, but the technique specific results. This is um, practically the average discharge of the patient to home with the, for the similar fusion. And uh, in one of the hospitals that we are the only people providing this care, um, most average uh, hospital stay, including elderly, multi-level is 1.6 days. Now, who can we do this surgery for? Um, I, I mean, the papers are written. I'm sure if you're interested, please contact me. We can talk more about it. And we have even observation in our own permanent lab. The indication for um, this surgery is totally based on your experience. Obviously, I didn't start with a case like this. Yeah, and we st I started with one level, no significant deformity, no great tulistasis. But once you get good with the instrumentation, with the initial algorithmic uh, procedure, you can just replicate it, and then you can do this. Now, this is done through multiple small incision. And, uh, and practically, 
the result of that, that we do that kind of surgery day in, day out, over 1,550 cases in performance like this. And everybody who goes through the learning curve can perform this at the same level. So you truly need to be just a surgeon to be able to algorithmically follow this. Uh, and that is the word algorithms come from, following certain level that gives you the same results. The results are patient that otherwise would not be really suitable for open traditional surgery. So like this patient was rejected by, legitimately rejected by three other surgeons for traditional surgery, bad, uh, you know, heart, um, elderly, osteoporosis, lots of different factors that would prevent that, that practically she was just so, yeah, the only option she has is living with that. But now by reducing the trauma associated with surgery, all of a sudden, you can provide them with a choice. Now, I'm going to talk just a little about the technique. If, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Cambin Triangle. I use 2C arm, and it took me just 250 cases to learn what is the optimum positioning of those 2C arms. So this knowledge is really gained the hard way. We, in the AP and lateral, and that's what it is, 2C arm, every time I shoot an X-ray, I re-register the patient based on anatomical knowledge. I, uh, we identified the midline of the disc in the APN lateral, and then uh, with the neuromonitoring probe, we approached the Cambin triangle with three milliamp stimulation. Then we entered the disc. Um, before that, we stimulated at four milliamp. Then a K-wire goes in, a dilator goes in, and a tube, eight millimeter tube inside, 10 millimeter outside goes in, and then the magic is about the instrumentation. You will see some of that in the other room. And it is only about this truly advanced instrumentation that we can go through an eight millimeter tube, perform discectomy, and prepare the end plate. And there, I'm always asked, can you do discectomy? Can you prepare the end plate? With the right instrumentation, absolutely. Another thing is, but some uh, experience, you can choose where you put the cage. You can put the cage right or left, front or back, and correct for sagittal and coronal deformities. In our paper, we showed that uh, you can correct five to seven degree sagittal deformity in the um, pre-op CT to post-op CT. That is a routine for us. And we are a, a private institution and not academic. So we have always pre-operative CT and post-operative CT, though, and we can measure that. And uh, then the question of the fusion is as well that, uh, like all muscle sparing technique, the fusion rate is in higher 90th percentile. And we have published um, 11 papers, two about the uh, preoperative and uh, one-year outcome with 303 patients. Our 1,000 patient study is in progress. I will keep you updated. Now, the end result is that you, know, you achieve that. I'm not using P cage anymore. I'm using uh, titanium cages. But the result is that you can uh, truly reduce the impact of the surgery on the patient and make even multi-level fusion uh, day surgery kind of procedure. And we have been uh, practicing it um, for the last 10 years where we could show even in a, a bigger cases, elderly, most of these patients go home next day. It, it was hard for me, so, uh, some, for myself to really believe that I, this is really working, but you now I start taking patient testimonials. Now we have over 1,200 patient testimonials just before discharge, a week later, a month later, six months later, a year later, that showing that uh, truly this result as well are sustained. So I'm going to stop here and get some um, uh, question maybe, but this is actually a demonstration, a cartoonish demonstration of how um, the approach in relationship to um, nerve root and the Cambian triangle is. But I, I'll stop here and take some questions. A um, couple of questions. So thanks for, for the uh, talk. And I think the x-rays that you showed are actually really compelling. Um, a couple of questions are for you. So you're, you're taking a 45 degree approach into the Cambian triangle, right? Um, um. And uh, roughly, approximately 45 degrees. Um, do you have any visualization before you get into the Cambrian Triangle, or is it percutaneous? And that's a very good question. I uh, started actually using endoscopy with that. And like um, another doctor as well from Germany, Dr. Weigel, he and I, we talked about that. Um, at the, after a few cases, after 
significant number of the cases, I noticed that really endoscopy doesn't give me any additional um, value. So what I did is I'm just using the 2C arm and the value of the neuromonitoring, and I don't aim for the Cambin triangle directly. I aim for the pedicle of the level below and just run the probe on the periosteum down to the Cambin triangle, and we have been collecting our data. Um, so, and as well, we tried to have a, actually we uh, created what we call a handheld microscope that you can put on the tube and visualize everything. But as well, that didn't really give me any clinical value. So I abandoned that. Right now, it's, uh, there is no, I don't really, you can, but you don't have to have a direct visualization. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, the extrafemoral approach, as you mentioned, uh, which targets on the uh, superior lateral aspect of the inferior pedicle, like you mm -hmm. described. Um, I think it's a pretty safe approach, but I think, you know, as a surgeon, I, I still personally feel pretty strongly about visualization of the entry point into the, into the disc because sometimes you have aberrant nerve roots. Um, it can mm -hmm. be a, a low, you know, duplication, a low, you know, a, a low runoff of the nerve root. Sometimes the nerve root sits right on the disc space, and I think without visualization, you're going to get one out of a hundred patients, yeah. you're going to get that nerve root. Um, <laughs> And then number two for me, uh, would you mind just describing the discectomy a little bit? Uh, what tools mm -hmm. are you using? I saw some shavers. There was a mix of different companies on there on that on that uh, on that thing here. Exactly. So you know, for example, um, there's one Spinology. Where is it? Yeah, the the, the tool from you know this this the shaver seems to be Spinology blades. Uh, it seems like you have a little bit of a hodgepodge of different That's stuff exactly there. right. It's a hodgepodge. Okay. Let, so let me take talk us through. about your first question. I'm still very uh, tense when I'm doing these cases. So as surgeon, we are very risk uh, adverse. So meaning that um, I didn't start doing that uh, 50, 60 degree scoliosis to start with. I'm, I was very selective for my cases. And just my, uh, this is 12 years now, and my uh, level of confidence has increased with my clinical results. And I was very, at, very, at first I was, I was very, the other question I get a lot is that does the indirect decompression works or not? I mean, most of us that do here this kind of surgery, uh, we do believe that indirect or what I call physiologic anatomic decompression works. So uh, I'm still very concerned about uh, visualization and so on, but uh, my experience came from visualizing and not visualizing and making no change in my result except adding one hour to the surgery. Regarding the, the second question, you're absolutely right. This is a hodgepodge of instrument that make your work, you know, in a way, I'm a MacGyver. Can you take me through? Can you take me through from left to right? What is yes, yes. Describe? So on the very left, you see a neuromonitoring probe. That neuromonitoring probe is very specific and is made for only for this purpose. You put electrode in the legs in all segments and you stimulate at three milliamp while you're approaching. While you aren't can be in triangle, you I stimulate at four milliamp. And uh, then once I'm good at four milliamp, that sleeve over that Y over that uh, neuromonitoring probe goes down. The probe itself is come down. The probe is Teflon coated, only the tip is available, so you're not dispersing energy, and you're not shunting with the sleeve. Then the K wire goes in through that, um, through that sleeve of the neuromonitoring probe. Then the sleeve comes out. The dilation device goes in. Even in the most degeneratively changed disc, you can get the, once you get the K wire in, the dilator open up the Cambin triangle as you go. We know that the nerve root is almost at the, uh, attached to the pedicle of the level above. So we are opening it as we go. And if you're interested, if you go to YouTube, just put the word impossible O-L-L-I-F, you will see a lots of um, uh, videos that shows you in actual patient how that works. Okay, once the dilator is placed, the handle comes off, that uh, tube, which is eight millimeter inside, 10 millimeter outside goes in, get um, hammered in with that, what I call a barrel, which is, looks like a barrel of a gun next to it. And the hammer obviously used to put that tube into the disc base. Then you have a... Barrel on the, on the handle or? So you see next to the, the, the dilator, there is a tube, like a T. Yeah. That T goes over the dilator, and the barrel goes over the dilator 
rests on the T, and then it helps me to hammer that T into the disk base. Then you have a safe approach from skin through the capsule to the disk base, and there are some criteria, how far you go and so on. Then the dilator comes out, then you have a eight millimeter tube approach from outside of the skin to the inside of the disk. The drill is only creating a path for the rest of the tools. Then the second one, the thick with the thick handle, is a, what you call a paddle shaver. It goes in, and I'm going to demonstrate it when I'm doing that, it, the paddles separate, and it goes up to 16 millimeters that you can turn, pivot, and create, a, you know, the, the, the corticate I'm sorry, they, they, they take the end plates off, the cartridge of the end plates off. We know a bad disc, they, when you do that, actually the cartilage comes off. they much more easier. As worse the disc uh, is, easier it, you can do the disc prep. Now, having said that, um, the, the, the third, most of the job is done with that long pituitary that goes in in a very specific way and removes the material. The, what you see next to that the pituitary is a loop curette that literally is directional. You go in and make a core cut into the cartilage and then by pivoting it, moving it up and down, goes from side to side, enables you to uh, remove the material. And then you next to the... the loop angle the handle the back? You yes, you open it up and the loop goes up. And that the loop in each direction goes about, I think, 12 or 14 millimeters. So you can create significant. And the next to that is what we call the articulating caret that goes in and it catches the end plates. And most of this is done by feeling. You know when your instrument is on a bone that you have this high frequency vibration through your finger, you can feel it that you are on the bone. And then the next instrument to that, after you have done the discectomy, removed everything, is actually you pack your biologic, and I'm going to show it to you as well. We did a lots of, we tried a lots of biologic. Um, it, the consistency of the biologic is important for this procedure, and the ceramic like tricalcium phosphate work best, but they are not the best biologic by themselves. But we have gone through a protocol that we learned over five years. We put Jamshidi in. First thing I do in the surgery, I put a Jamshidi in, and I take the, only the first five cc of the bone marrow, which has the much higher um, stem cells, and then I impregnate my biologic that look like a French fries. It has a certain consistency for three to five minutes. And then we have had very good results with that. It fits exactly in that tube, and we push it in, and then the next step is putting a K wire in, taking the tube, that T tube out, and then putting the cage in. The instrument on the total right side is another instrument that once we have put the, we achieve interbody and posterolateral fusion. We know that for posterolateral fusion, we have to put K-wires. That, that three instrument on the right side is a device that is eccentric, goes over the K-wire, it's centered on the facet, and we grind the surface of the facet, and we put biologic there, and we have good result that we achieve posterolateral fusion, not instrumentation. You put that for the inferior contralateral, was it over both sides? For the for both inferior, sides. For the inferior, uh, screws, right? Well, now obviously the very top proximal screws, they don't get this device. They don't get facetectomy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all the inferior facet, the K wire, in the, the, at least the way we put it, we go pretty lateral, the, and the inferior lateral to the facet, and then the, the device centers, because it's eccentric, centers centers on the facet and with the pivotal kind of, I have videos of that as well online if you're interested. It truly not just the it truly grinds the surface of the facet and we don't just put biology, we tap biologic into the pores that uh, quite significantly gives us advantage of interbody and posterolateral fusion. Mm -hmm. So the, the instrument, second, sorry, Paul, you can address me anytime. That from the, from the right side, that is the tool that you slam into the facet joint. Is it, so, is it uh, serrated in front or is it? it? You got it, exactly. So once the K-wire is in place, I already have gotten my bone marrow from the Jamshidi, K-wire is in. The next instrument is that dilator that just goes on and open, dilates the fascia and the mus muscle. The second instrument is what you see uh, next to the dilator is that device that there are two, that is actually two piece. In, there is a conical dilator, which is eccentric as you see, and the K-wire goes as such that when you put it in, 
it centers, it pushes your device forward, superomedial, and then you, the serrated tip of that device grinds the superomedial of the facet, then the cone comes out, biologic goes in, and the tap, this flat piece, pushes the biologic in. It takes about 30 seconds per facet to do that. I have to admit that I still visualize that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think for MIS fusions, uh, especially T lifts that are you know a little bit limited, it's not as you know like Vic showed us, you know, like a big graft. You know, I think the posterior lateral facet fusion is really, really important. Um, and and I use the navigated drill, accentuate the joint, um, and then honestly, that's one of the advantages of the endoscope because you know, it just takes you two seconds to get it down and visualize. I still like to visualize, wash it out, see the bone, drill a little bit more, but again, it takes a lot of time. I think this yes. is a really, really, really neat little solution. It would be fun to kind of get some CT scans and see what yeah. it does. We have 10 years of CT scan. Every patient of us get pre-op CT, one month CT, six month CT, one year CT, and we have 1,550 patients. With uh, I generally follow them up one and a half to two years, but we have 10 years of data that we have collected. Having said that, I struggled a lot because I was trained traditionally, to do everything traditionally. I struggled a lot the first five years, truly, not to um, do the, 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 or forego the visual, in, uh, visual inspection. I'm a pilot, you know, and it was easy to learn fly by vision, VFR, visual flight rules. When I went to do uh, instrument flight rules, to rely on instrument and other th information beside my vision, I was sweating a lot as well to go from visual flight rule to instrument flight rule, and it's not, no different. And I talked to a lots of people who do laparoscopy. They went through the same process. When they went from open cases to laparoscopy, they still visualize, but just when you learn to go over direct vision, everything is in front of you, just the fact that your hands are in here and your eyes are somewhere else, that, that requires some um, training and some uh, practical learning curve. Sorry, we're going to have to sure. keep going. Uh, just finish up. But we're no, no, I'm done. I'm up. just answering question. Okay. I'm done. No, so um, I, I, I think it's very novel, but it, it reminded me of a different procedure you may have heard of like years ago. It's called ELIF. I had to look it up again because I, rem I remember it. And it was an extra, it was extra foraminal lateral. Mm -hmm. uh, or extra femoral lumbar into biofusion. It's, it's a similar technique. It was a 45 yeah. degree angle into uh, the disc space. And, and, and the reason why I think it never took off in popularity was lack of visualization. It was a blind pass in that area. Yep, yep. Um, um, if so, I may answer that just two minutes. Um, about nine months before Dr. Kambin died, he and I had a conversation. You know, Kambin Triangle, Dr. Parviz Kambin, another person like us, um, was this, uh, described in the end of 70s, beginning of 80s. This is not a new approach. He just took a, he told me, he took a and the uroscopic, urology scope, put it in, and he did his decompression. And this technique didn't really tr thrive in the US. It went to Asia, Korea, China, uh, Japan, and it came back in pieces and many people, including Wang in Miami and so on, or Spinology, they are utilizing many, many aspects of this, and they have many names. What they have in common, that it is muscle sparing. You go, you are not far lateral, you are transcambine, and there's a huge difference there because in the far lateral, you are still posterior. In a trans, true transcambine, the reason you can endoscopy with transcapping approach, you are in the retroperitoneal space anterior to transverse process. And that makes it, again, as a matter of fact, a 360. Now, there is another version of this procedure. I use the same instrumentation. I'm not in cambium triangle. That's a rescue technique that I'm anterior to the nerve root. And I perform it since 2015. I'm performing prolateral with this technique. And uh, I published my paper in 2017 regarding this. I have. 300 cases meanwhile for that. But they, they, this is not a far lateral approach. It has many names, like Endolif. The Vang in Miami calls it Endolif. So I'm not the only person performing that. There are lots of people with some modification performing it nationwide and globally. Thank you. <laughs>